So if you think about it, it's very easy to exploit people that are in need. Fear of retaliation of being exploited. Unfamiliar with managing your own finances. Again, there are a lot of seniors that don't deal with money on a day-to-day -day basis. And all of a sudden, now you're having to deal with your own finances and may not be accustomed to doing so. When you have cognitive impairment, hear me clearly, a lot of our seniors who have diminished mental capacity can easily be exploited. And again, those who are dependent upon family members uh, to care for them, to cook for them. Again, those are areas where we need to watch and to verify and to make sure that those relationships are intact so that we are not, again, allowing our seniors to be exploited. But those are all areas where it's easy to take advantage of those that are already in need. Here are some examples, examples of financial exploitation. Uh, when you have to have a power of attorney and that person you're signing over your authority and your rights to your funds for another person to make decisions on your behalf. That is what a power of attorney is, right? Investment scams and frauds. We see that every single day, especially when there is a disaster uh, we recently had hurricanes over in Noonan, right? The moment something like that happens, you'll start seeing phone scams, email scams, whether it's local or whether it's a national event. Again, the elderly can be exploited. Why? They want to be helpful. Um, theft of property from family members, caregivers, in-home helpers. Again, that one is self-explanatory. And then lottery and sweepstakes scams. That one is an old one and it has not gone away. And you know, I don't know what it is about getting something for nothing, but trust me, you cannot get something from nothing. And so many people fall, fall prey to this. Again, you can live up 400 or down 20. It doesn't matter the zip code. Our elders can fall prey to everything that's on that screen. Another example, and I've seen this many times in the Coca-Cola Credit Union, believe it or not, again, doesn't matter the zip code, grandparents and imposter scams. Uh, elders receive an email that their grandson is in California and can't get back home or on vacation on the islands and can't get back home and need help. Can you send me a bank wire? Can you go to Western Union and send me some funds? Again, our elders are so quick to help without verifying what they expect and what the sources of that email or that chat could be from. It could be fraudulent. Um, tax and debt collection. Listen, I know this one in my sleep. And I will say to you, when we talk about taxes, the IRS does not email you. They will not email you. You will receive a letter from the IRS. You may receive a telephone call after you have received your letter in writing, but you will not receive an email from the IRS. And you'll hear more about that later. Charity scams, we've already spoken on that one. And then of course, telemarketing. Oh my God, this thing right here. We want our seniors to be connected, but at the same time, if they lose that ability to be savvy, they can become exploited seniors. So be very, very careful and share what you know. Ask your parents, how's it going? Are you receiving phone calls? What are you doing? To make sure, again, we put barriers in place to prevent fraud and exploitation of our seniors. Telephone and computer scams, I think we've talked about that. Another thing about computer scams, you have your uh, uh, fraudulent letters, from other countries, I'm a king, I'm a queen, I, I have a lump sum of money I wanna bring to your states. I'll give you a portion if you share your checking and banking account. I want you to know this happens every day. And I also want you to know we fall prey. We as people fall prey to this scam. Identity theft, this has not gone away. Even in the electronic age, it has just gotten worse uh, as we have breaches and we have things that occur that makes it easier for identity theft to occur. It's not even a matter of 
if it will occur, it's a matter of when. What we have to teach now is prevention, but it will occur. Reverse mortgage, I don't want to speak too much on that. I don't recommend getting a mortgage as a reverse mortgage. That's just me personally. But I will tell you, I do still see commercials on TV talking about reverse mortgages, where you take out a loan as a senior, pull equity out of your home, and you don't have to pay that funds back. It, those funds are used as additional income while you are living. Once you're no longer living, someone has to now pay that reverse mortgage back. Be very careful with that product. And again, this one is relevant today. Contractors knocking on your home, calling you home improvement. We're all home from the pandemic, right? We're all teleworking and Zooming every day. And I promise you, even in my subdivision, had someone knock on the door, hey, do you need some new windows? Hey, we're gonna be cutting trees down in your area. No, thank you. No, thank you. Again, unless I call that contractor, I'm not interested because I don't know what their intentions are. And unfortunately, again, our seniors fall prey to some of these scams. Pay now or pay 50 or 70% and then we'll come do the work. And again, seniors are trusting, whereas with some situations like a contractor, no, we, we want to trust, but we want to trust but verify. Again, I would prefer to call that, that contractor rather than someone to walk in my subdivision and knock on doors. So again, these are areas of simple but constant exportation of our seniors. And who are the abusers? Again, we've talked about this one. I won't beat around the bush here. Sometimes it's those closest to our hearts. It's our family members. It's our caregivers. It's our, our neighbors who know that we're vulnerable, right? Those that we have come into acquaintance with. Sometimes it could be someone who has a doable power of attorney. Those that are should be our financial advisors and they're not uh, doing what we have asked or expected of them to do. Could be strangers. Again, we've talked about this, the telephone scam, the internet scam, home repair and contractors, medical scam, someone knowing your social and your Medicare number, and then you're not checking your mail and you see procedures. You may have had a simple procedure, but you're billed for three and four procedures, right? A lot of these different things are taking place because we don't inspect what we expect. Check your mail. Check your status in terms of your billing. When you go to have a procedure, then verify your billing. Make sure that your billing is correct and hold your doctor's office accountable. Why, do, why don't older adults report exploitation? Well, I will tell you, when you're already vulnerable, when it's your son or your daughter or your grandchild, or I don't want to get that person in, in trouble. I don't want my caregiver to lose their job. There are lots of reasons. Denial. No, that didn't happen to me. I don't want anyone to know I lost $75,000 in a scam. My family will put me in a home. I, I won't be able to take care of myself. I won't have to have my, my independence. A lot of things will keep our seniors from shame from telling us what has happened, and then from having to deal with the repercussions can be uncomfortable. All right, telephone scams, internet, we've talked about that. Contractors, home repairs, we've talked about that. All right, and who can help? And I will tell you, financial institutions are a first defense, first line of defense reporter to the federal government. Elder exploitation is a regulation by state law. So financial institutions are mandatory reporters. However, it's when we identify it. So it could go on for a year or two and that may look like a normal pattern. I may not be aware, but when we are aware in terms of a financial institution, we are mandatory reporters to the federal government. And what does that look like? We fill out a form, we report it to the government, that caseworker will call us from the elder exploitation department, interview the person that is the reporter, and I'll use myself as an example. I'll 
explain the scenario. And that state representative will visit that senior and verify, is there any exploitation going on? Okay, so I just want you guys to know this is very serious. It's taken very serious, but it's only when it's identified. Again, you can call the police, you can call protective services. Who's responsible to do that? Banks and credit unions, okay? Your financial institutions are responsible to be first line of defense reporters. Next slide. And then financial exploitation by fiduciary. And what is a fiduciary? A person that acts only in your interests, manages your money, and keeps your money and property separate than their funds. No commingling of funds. And then we expect them to keep good records. What is a power of attorney? This is a very powerful document. A power of attorney is a legal document drafted by an attorney that allows someone else to handle the financial business on behalf of a senior or whomever. You could be in the military and sign the power of attorney, active duty military. You could be married and traveling overseas. You don't have to be a senior but you do have to have it drafted by an attorney to ensure that attorney knows the state laws in which you live, right? And I'll give you an example. I live in Georgia. My dad was starting to pay bills more than once. And so I recognized there was some diminished capacity there. So I contacted a family attorney in Michigan. Again, you wanna make sure it's an attorney who is aware of the state laws in which the resident lives, not where you live. Okay, so again, a very powerful document that gives you all rights to manage funds for someone else. That is what a power of attorney does. You can be added to an account. You can open an account. You can close an account. So again, it's a very powerful document where one will sign away rights to allow another person to manage their financial portfolio. Next slide. All right, power of attorney safeguards. Trust, but verify. If your power of attorney says your power of attorney can open an account, leave it in there. If you don't want them to open an account, don't put it in your power of attorney. Put, be very specific in what you want that person to be able to do. But a power of attorney, you wanna be able to trust the person who has it to make sure that your funds are not being mismanaged. You want to tell them exactly what they can and cannot do in that power of attorney. And when needed, if you need to change it, change it. But I will tell you, if the person continues to start to have diminished mental capacity, they won't even know to change it. So you wanna make sure that whoever you give, whomever you give access and rights to your funds, that you trust that person, that they manage their own money well, that they keep good financial records, that's the key, and that they do not commingle your funds with their funds. Again, someone that you trust that manages money and property well. Next slide, please. Three minutes for sale. All right, again, plan ahead. We don't have to be a senior to do a power of attorney. That can be done today. And I always caution people because of the land of the pandemic that we're navigating, it's a good idea to have a power of attorney. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be a senior. Think about what are my assets? <laughs> who's, who's on bench with me? Am I married? What, do I have a partnership? Whatever your scenario, what's your bench in case you break an ankle, break a leg, right? What is your plan? Next slide. Again, this is more language. This just tells you what you can insert or remove from your power of attorney. Next slide. And if you are a victim, again, you have adult protective services, you have law enforcement, and you can also contact your financial institution who is a first line of defense and can report on your behalf. Next slide. 
Again, abusers are caregivers in homes. This we have to be very careful about um, because again, we don't want our grandchildren, our grandsons, our son. We don't want to get our family members in trouble, but we want to hold them accountable. So again, be very, very, very careful who we hire and inspect what you expect from that caregiver. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. One, slide, one thing I do want to say is automatic bill pay is critical, right? Because this prevents you from having to think about, did I pay my light bill? Did I pay my gas bill? It prevents you from having to give that debit card and that check card to do things that can be done automatically. So again, turn on your banking alerts. When there is a large withdrawal, you need to know. You can get a text message or an email. So I highly recommend you guys let mm -hmm. your seniors know to turn on their banking alerts. Next slide. Again, do not uh, let caregivers have access to paying bills and managing finances if that's not the role you have hired for them. Uh, never promise your assets for caregiving in exchange. Again, I always say if people have money and they're good with money, that might be a person to consider. But if you don't know what their expert is and their strength is. That's not a person I want managing my money, right? Know what you know and what you don't know, don't expect it or manage it or allow folks to manage your assets and your banking and your credit uh, when that's not what you hired them to do. Next slide. The same would be the, uh, the case with managing your overall investments. Again, last week, I think Bernie Madoff, the largest money schemer in the United States history, passed away. He had received 150 years from the Ponzi scheme. Again, we all can fall prey. Uh, the rich and the not rich can fall prey to Ponzi scheme. So again, make sure when you invest your portfolio, is someone you have vetted and that you trust and you verify your statements. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Again, make sure you trust but verify when you're dealing with an investment broker. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, next slide. I think all of those, we've kind of talked through those throughout the investment piece. And again, any funds that you have at a financial institution, a bank or a credit union is insured per account up to a certain amount. What's covered, what's in your checking, what's in your saving, what's in your money market and your certificates of deposit. What is not insured, again, are stocks and bonds, investment portfolio. So again, items that are in a safe deposit, your annuities, again, all of those things when you talk about your investment half is not insured. So again, you want to trust but verify those that you are allowing to manage your portfolio. Okay, and I think we're coming to a close here. Again, each and every account within a financial institution is insured up to a certain amount per account. So a single, a joint, a trust account, all of those funds that are in those accounts are insured. Okay, next slide. I think we're coming to a close. So uh, do we have any questions on the elder expectation, the account fraud, identity theft, any questions uh, in, that, in that arena I'm happy to uh, take at this time. So I would say, Pamela, do you see any questions in the chat? Okay, so for the sake of time, Brenda, what we'll do, we'll, oh, Brent, oh, you are there, Pamela, go ahead. Venetia is handling that. Venetia, anything in the chat?
Okay, well, why don't I just look? The, good morning, ladies. This is TK. May I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Okay, Vershell, um, great information. Thank you so much. You've mentioned several times, inspect what you expect. I love that. And you said some things like, instead of people coming up to your door, call that company and make sure they are who they say they are. What are some other things we can do to verify? Trust, but verify. Great question. Thank you. So whenever you receive an email, and I always do this, I never respond to an email, never click on links in an email. If you receive an email from a bank or a credit union, turn around and use your own computer, open a new browser and email directly for yourself. Call the toll free number that you already have on record to verify your bank or your credit union is trying to reach out to you. Oftentimes, again, we will receive a text message or an email, oh my God, my account's been breached. And then you start putting in your personal information without verifying it. And that's what people, right, fraudsters, that's what they're anticipating. That's called phishing, right? I'll send out a thousand emails, but out of that thousand, somebody's gonna respond and put in their personal information. So when I say trust but verify, call the number that you have on your billing statement and verify your creditor sent that email to you, right? Trust, but verify. Don't always um, listen to what they're saying and say, let me think about it. Let me, let me call my son or my daughter and I will call you back. Never share your debit card, your checking, your any of your personal information over the phone when you receive a request for it. Again, we just have to be mindful that we are we want to be helpful but you also want to make sure you're speaking to who you think you're speaking with thank you no that's a great point because i know i've gotten calls where they'll say it's like they give you enough information that you start to feel like well they they know me they have my stuff but then they ask for that birthday or they ask for your social or they ask for something that it just seems like they give you enough to make you feel a little more confident and it's still not, as soon as you start challenging them, they just hang up because it was something fraudulent in the first place. I, so I will tell you, financial institutions are trying to move away from those types of questions. What's your mother's maiden name? Because it's too common. And now we're moving towards financial questions, out of pocket questions. What was your last two debit card transactions, right? Because we, we are your financial institution, we can see it. So then I can say, oh, I went to Starbucks this morning. Okay, I know I'm speaking with, you know, to kill your steward. Out of pocket financial questions is what I want to verify with you to make sure you are who you say you are. Because I already have the data. I don't need you to read it to you. So we want to, again, trust but verify to make sure you know who you're speaking with. Great question. Thank you so much. Any other there questions? There is a question for the chat. Can I offer that question? Absolutely. If someone's a legal guardian and um, POA of protected person, can guardianship designation be removed and just POA status or just returned, retained? I'm going to tackle that one. Then I'm going to turn that over to Pamela Harris Jenkins, who, <laughs> who is a CPA and an attorney. I will say to you, guardianship goes through the court. Guardianship goes through the court. POA only goes through an attorney. So I can draft up my POA, have my attorney draft it up, sign it, and then submit it to my bank. And then I can change that out. But guardianship cannot just be removed. It goes through the court system. Pamela, did you want to add to that? In addition to that, in your POA, you can designate uh, your power of attorney to be your guardian. But that is a preference that, again, will go through the courts. But that preference can be uh, placed in your power of attorney. Beautiful. Great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. All right. Those are all the questions for the chat. Michelle, okay. thank you for that. Great. Thank you, ladies. We will move on to our next topic uh, regarding scams. And I think there's um, one question. There is not a virtual hand, but a real hand being raised. Go ahead, okay. Madam President. Well, <clears throat> I had both up just to be sure. Oh, um, sorry, I saw the virtual now. Forgive yeah. me. Good morning, and thank you all so much. I really quick the reversible mortgage. I cannot tell anybody, please do not be careful. When you have elderly parents, <clears throat> excuse me, 
who signed up for that because my mother and stepdad signed up legally with that. We got an attorney to try to get them out of it. We could not because it was all legally done. It was terrible terms. <clears throat> we ended up waiting. We couldn't do anything until they both passed away. And we then had to go back and buy the house back through the terms of the contract. So if anybody sees, has in any way, please tell your elderly parents to check with you before they look into something, <clears throat> excuse me, like that. It was horrible. Powerful information, thank you. Just a point of clarification on that, um, Sir Battle. Uh, a reverse mortgage is nothing more than that, a mortgage. So if your parents are alive even, they have the right to sell their home, they just have to cash it out. So be clear, you don't have to wait until your parents die to uh, alleviate an, a, a reverse mortgage. You can go in and actually try to uh, have it refinanced and get a, and as long as you pay that reverse mortgage back, there is no requirement that they die first. Understood. And that was lesson learned. I mean, it was just, it took us a lot of money just to try to, after they had signed it, they realized that is not what they had intended to do. They didn't realize that they were going to leave their heirs with the debt potentially like that. So, and that's not what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Good point, good point. So there's one more question in the chat before we go to our next speaker. And it okay. is, what if you know your grandmother's daughter is taking advantage of her and your grandmother's in denial? Are there options? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Cause again, we're talking about the relationship of a mother and a daughter. And I'm sure that mother uh, receives services, you know, hair salon, go to the doctor's office. So she, the daughter may be a partial caregiver. Uh, I would, you know, it's just a tricky situation there to be quite honest with you because that's who's going to take care of the mother. But I will say what you can do, and I'm, I'll just be transparent. What I did in taking care of my dad's finances, you know, my dad was in Michigan. My sister took care of my dad excellently, phenomenally. I took care of all the money. But what I also did is every time I paid a bill, I sent an email to my siblings. This was paid. This is this. This is how much it was every single month for years so that there was no doubt. So what you can do is say, you know what, let's get the other siblings involved and let's get on one accord to make sure funds are being used for the grandmother. That is what I highly recommend. Make sure other siblings are aware and voice what needs to be done to help take care of that elder aging parent. Michelle, In addition well to that, in addition to that, I see that the original person who had that power of attorney passed away last year. As long as the mother continues to have capacity to make a contract, you can always have her to prepare another power of attorney. And again, as Rochelle said, you're dealing with family. Family's funny, but family gets real funny if mom passes away, then it's a fight. Uh, and you're in court for minimum two, as many as 10 years. Okay. Thank you so all much. Right. Thank that, you yeah. all uh, for that. We need to move on to our next topic. And so if we have any other questions, we'll sit to the side. We'll hopefully that we may be able to get back to them at the end. The next topic will be about scams and our presenter, Sean Carroy. He has been serving the public at the Georgia Department of Laws Consumer Protection Division, formerly the Governor Office of Consumer Protection for over 20 years. Currently, he acts as community Missions and outreach coordinator and is involved in the enforcement of numerous civil statutes. Sean provides speeches on behalf of CPD, is a media spokesperson for the division, tracks leg, leg, excuse me, leg, legislation impacting consumers at the General Assembly and serves as a resource for its members. Additionally, Sean is the liaison for the Attorney General's Consumer Advisory Board Sean holds an undergraduate degree from Kennesaw State University. And so we'll have Sean to make his presentation and let me get the information back on the screen. Well, while we're setting up, Brenda, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and, and we're very pleased um, to be invited to this event Delta Sigma Theta and DeKalb County Library System. Thank you for having us. 
and Verschel, what a great presentation. That information, um, as I was listening to it, you know, our office receives 20,000 contacts a year, complaints, inquiries. So we hear from people who are in the situations that you are talking about. And the information that is just so important to share with others, um, you know, I'd encourage everyone on this, on the Zoom this morning to take something that you've picked up and share it with, with someone you know. Um, there's power in that. And um, our office uh, originally was the governor's office of consumer affairs when it started in 1975. And in, a few years ago, we moved uh, to the attorney general's office. At the time, attorney general, the attorney general was Sam Owens and our attorney general now, Chris Carr, leads the office. And our division, our mission is to protect, as you see on the screen, protect consumers and legitimate businesses from unlawful, deceptive, and unfair practices in the marketplace. Um, we enforce a number of consumer protection laws that I'll talk about and through education, which is why I'm here this morning. Uh, next slide, please. And the, the main law that we enforce is the Fair Business Practices Act. And, uh, you know, I'm not an, an attorney. I've been with the office for, for a number of years. And, and you don't need, the point is you don't need to be an attorney to understand what this law says. If you see something unfair and deceptive in a consumer transaction, an advertisement that is claiming one thing and actually delivers another, that, that can be against the law. Um, and our office also enforces Georgia's new car lemon law. Uh, last year, we realized, in some years, we realized about $20 million in savings for consumers when vehicles are repurchased or replaced through the lemon law process. And in the interest of time, I won't go into each of these law, uh, laws that we enforce. Uh, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we have about 20,000 complaints that come in. Um, we have investigations. We have about 50 employees in the office, a number of attorneys and investigators uh, that try to stop the practices if they're unlawful, get restitution for victims. Uh, next slide, please. And our complaint case breakdown, about a, a quarter of what we see involve money, debt collection, abusive debt management uh, schemes, credit repair practices. I mean, we've all seen those signs on the side of the road that say improve your credit score. Um, and often those turn out to be uh, uh, illegal. Uh, so we look at those, are, we do have cases with credit repair companies. Automobiles is another area. Uh, there are uh, issues with repairs, failures to deliver title. And then as Rochelle talked about, we have some out and out scams uh, that, that we see the grandparent scam. And I'll talk a little more in depth about these in the further down in the presentation. Next slide, please. And this is our top complaint categories for this past year. Debt issues um, were at the top of the list with, with the economy uh, and the COVID crisis. We saw uh, a number of contacts about debt issues. Used car sales, number two. Uh, our state of emergency has been in place with a price gouging uh, statute uh, implemented uh, since March of, of last year. And so we've received a number of complaints uh, involving price gouging. And next slide, please. Um, I do wanna mention uh, a guide that we have created that is available at our website, consumer.ga.gov. We worked with a number of different organizations to create this guide, everyone from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to the AARP uh, uh, to the Better Business Bureau. And we held focus groups and we asked older adults uh, and experts in the field, what do we need to include in a guide that will be helpful? Uh, this guide includes information about elder abuse, many of the topics Rochelle talked about, uh, and uh, I, to issues before the chat, we were talking about some of the funeral issues. Uh, Brenda was mentioning that there, that, 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 that was uh, uh, an interesting topic in, inside the guide that uh, people comment on. 
Uh, so I'd encourage you to get the guide. There are hard copies available uh, if you would like to contact us and order some, but we also have it available in HTML format online. Uh, and it's, so that's, that's available. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now we get into the, 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 the scam issues. We, since the beginning of the pandemic, have seen a number of COVID-19 related scams. I've got a couple of examples of text messages that have been sent out. Uh, some of these involve the stimulus. Uh, recently, we've, we've started to hear and become more concerned about vaccine related scams. We issued a press, joint press release with the Georgia Department of Public Health recently warning about vaccine scams and the fact that the Department of Health will not call to verify your social security uh, number or your Medicare or Medicaid over the number over the phone. Um, but the scam artists take advantage of any uh, event that, you know, Rochelle mentioned the tornado in Noonan. Um, any event that pops up, the scam artists are, are ready to, to take advantage of them. So be aware of those. On our website, again, at consumer.ga.gov, we have a, a, a page dedicated to COVID-19 scams. In fact, if you go to consumer.ga.gov slash coronavirus, you'll find a whole page dedicated um, with all topics COVID, including information about um, um, rent subsidies, you know, a number of people are, uh, are um, suffering economically and may need some assistance. So we have links to that. We, we just tried to gather everything we could onto the one particular page at consumer.ga.gov slash coronavirus. Next slide, please. And I, I'm gonna breeze through this in the interest of time. Um, next slide, please. I want to get to this is the one I want to get to. Um, we've received over 1,100 price gouging complaints uh, since the event began last March. Uh, a majority of these, a vast majority of these complaints came in during the first six to nine months of the uh, of the pandemic. In recent months, we're seeing far fewer price gouging complaints. Uh, the and as you can see, you know, food prices went up uh, in in, in Consumers were very sensitive to that in the beginning of the uh, pandemic. So we received a number of complaints involving, you know, the price of eggs, the price of, of meat. Uh, and then, of course, face mask cleaning supplies topped the list. And let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, next slide, please. Of some of the price gouging uh, issues we saw. Um, $128 for uh, Lysol. Um, next slide, please. And then this outrageous uh, listing, you know, somebody decided that they, they would post, you know, we had the run on toilet paper, but this is an actual um, uh, posting that we, we did find. And so what we do when we receive price gouging complaints is we contact, if it's online, we try to work with the um, platforms, the Ebays, the Amazons, and contact them and say, look, there's an issue with this particular posting. Let's see what we can do about it. Um, and then that has gone far to reduce the number of price gouging issues that we've seen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, government imposter scams are something. Next slide, please. Um, that we're seeing uh, where um, individuals posing as, say, Social Security, posing as the IRS, um, contact individuals and claim they're from, or, and sometimes they even claim they're from the Georgia Attorney General's office. And they'll go so far as to find out names of employees who work in, in this office. And this can happen, happen anywhere. They try to add, as we, we talked about earlier in the program, there's one kernel of truth in the scam, enough to make you go, maybe that's real. And the scam artists are using, you know, uh, fear. They're using, they you always use a sense of urgency that you have to act now. And we as humans want to please, you know, we want to, we want to respond and be helpful and, 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 
and and if there's something that needs to be addressed, we want to address it. Scam artists know that they try to take advantage of it. Uh, next slide, please. And we talked a bit. We 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 receive these weekly. Uh, this preys a bit on the 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 fact that we all you know sometimes we if, if something we can obtain um for free we might we tend to want to do that um with with fake check and money order scams especially with the fake check scams the the con artists are relying on the fact that the the financial institution has an obligation to provide you with funds once you deposit a check um, in a certain number of days when it may take more time for the financial institution to, to realize that the check that was deposited is fraudulent and then the the citizen is on the hook for what they they uh, what they what they did deposit next slide please and with id theft rochelle said something very important earlier it's not it, 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 it it's not if id theft is going to happen it's when it's going to happen so we need to take uh, steps now to protect ourselves and one of the best ways to do that is getting a credit freeze. Next slide, please. Um, also, checking credit reports regularly is important. In, in Georgia, you can receive two free credit reports per year for free. You can receive one free credit report for free annually. That's how it works when in normal times. Currently, we are gr being granted access to our credit reports once a week until April of next year from the credit reporting agencies because of, uh, of a, a law Congress passed. And so I, one thing that consumers can do is check your credit report regularly to see if there's anything that's, that doesn't look right. Next slide, please. And I, we've got some information on here. And, and this information is available on our website as well. Um, there are also other methods to protect your, yourself. Um, Social Security has a way to create a My Social Security account. You can go online and, and, and lock down basically your Social Security information. The IRS also has uh, uh, a way to protect yourself by creating an, a pin that will help prevent fraudsters from taking your your um, intercepting your IRS refund, and you can learn more about the the pin at irs.gov. Next slide, please. And I'm looking at the clock, and I want to leave time for questions too. But I do want to mention some creative scams that we're seeing as. Hopefully we're all vaccinated and we begin to make travel plans. Some of the scam artists are going so far as to creating uh, fake menus that they may slide under the door at the hotel and the hotel may have a QR code on it or they might have a phone number on it um, that is fraudulent. And so you call, you make your order and then you provide your credit card information. Um, so um, this is this is actually happening out there. So it's um, it's one more thing that we have to watch out for. Next slide, please. Uh, real quick, I'll talk about uh, emergency scams, and then I think I may stop and open it up to questions. Our information is available online. You know, if we're on Facebook, if we're on LinkedIn, um, even if we're not. Uh, public information is available. If you Google my name, you're probably going to figure out who my wife is, that I have two boys, that I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and that information, you, know, you can figure out who my relatives are. With that information, you might be able to call my a family member of mine and say, we've got your grandson, um, and if you do not, um, if you don't 
Uh, and you may hear muffled noises in the background. Uh, and these con artists go to great lengths to uh, create a ruse. And they'll, they'll say, if you don't wire us money, if you don't get a gift card and, uh, and tell us, you know, load it up and tell us the number on it, we're gonna hurt someone. Um, that call might come at two in the morning. So just be aware that these scam artists are, are, are if they did put their mind to good, you know, to, to good work, they'd probably be all right, but they've chosen the, to do this. Um, so be aware that the emergency scams are out there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there are employment scams going on around, you, uh, and this goes to the fake checks and reach shipping scams. They'll sometimes send fake checks as well. Um, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and see if we want to open it up to questions in the interest of time. And I do see a question here. If you sign up for credit reports, um, oh, and then Virchelle's answering the question. She's exactly right. It's not going to impact your impact your uh, credit if you pull your your credit reports. All right, I did see the question in the chat. Are there other questions that uh, people online would like to ask? <clears throat> Sean, that was very thorough. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right, I think we're good. Brenda, oh, oh, let me see, last the question. So have you seen an increase in crowdfunding scams? That's to you, Mr. Conroy. Fortunately, we have not. Um, we uh, do monitor that and we are in touch with um, the GoFundMes of the world. Uh, so if, if we do see something, we can alert them. Um, we, were, we were very much, and again, this is an area wherever there's a tragedy. You know, we recently had the, um, the spa shootings here in Atlanta and there was an outpouring of of sympathy that was shown on sites like GoFundMe for the families. And um, we monitored that. We were concerned that we would see scams develop, but we did not see that. Uh, and, and, and so we, we, that is something that is monitoring. Beautiful. I think the other question is, what is the result of addressing a price gap gouging yeah. are there consequences yes very good very good question thank you um, our office with the, the laws that we enforce in the office we have the ability to find companies um, and we can also um, many of the cases that we become involved with will uh, be settled with a document that is filed in court called an assurance of voluntary compliance where the company admits no wrongdoing mm -hmm. Uh, but they agree to stop a practice and potentially, you know, reimburse consumers if that is, if that is uh, proper. With the price gouging uh, situation, they, the companies can be fined. Um, or we will start off by notifying the business of the law. Mm -hmm. With price gouging in particular, uh, the and this is a this was up on the slide and and I, I, I maybe I should have gone a little more in detail. The business can pass on any price increase that they receive from the the wholesaler. So if they're paying more for say a bottle of water than they were before, they can they can increase the the amount uh, and the correspond you know, in a corresponding manner. Uh, and that's that's some of the investigative work that that we have to do in the office is determine um, in a situation where we open up an investigation did the company actually you know, were they own, were they simply passing on the costs uh, that they were being charged uh, and in a lot of cases that that did that is what hap what happens especially you know I, I mentioned those food issues uh, with grocery stores uh, a lot of the costs that the, the grocery stores were 
um, seeing it was because their wholesalers were charging them more for the for product. Um, and oh, very good question about repeat yeah. calls. Um, you know, there was a time when the do not call list worked great, and that time um, it, it has happened. Our office, um, our attorney general, um, and, and along with and other attorneys general have been, have been encouraging the Federal Communications Commission um, to increase the ability, uh, to, um, encouraging the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission to encourage the carriers to implement more and more technology that can be used to help stop the con artists. And this is, you know, part of this is enforcement um, of the con artists that are using, um, abusing the phone system. Um, and part of this is education as we, you know, we get the word out about the, how to use the technology that our phone carriers have to block calls. Um, and then the, also it, it, it is a, uh, it, the, the con artists are always, the, the phone companies, the carriers have to develop technology that's going to thwart the use of the, um, the phone system for these scams, but the, the con artists the are always trying to catch up and work the system. Uh, a great example of that is the caller ID that we have. Um, you know, we used to be able to rely on caller ID. Well, technology was developed to show, um, and a good example of this is the pharmacy, your local pharmacy. Um, when, if your prescription is ready, the pharmacy wants to be able to show you a phone number that's local, so you'll pick up. Um, when in reality, the, the phone call is coming from a call center out in the Midwest. So this technology was developed for a good purpose to, to try to show you that the, the call is coming from your local pharmacy, that your prescription is ready. But now anybody can go in and put a phone number um, make the phone number, you, you can go online now and get this, get the uh, technology to make it appear that um, you're calling, you know, you're, you're using any phone number to, to show up on your caller ID. And I think more and more people understand we can't rely on caller ID um, um, as much as we once did. Um, so the, 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 so getting back to the, the question, um, and I don't know if Rochelle or someone else wants to, to weigh in here. Um, it, there are steps you can take to stop them. I still get two a day, at least, um, asking me to buy a warranty for my car. Um, so it's, it, it is frustrating, um, yeah, but there's not one way to, to stop them right now. There is another question about something that you talked about, Sean, and that was around you know, how or where should we pull the weekly um, credit reports? We have that information uh, on our website and the, 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 where, but I will say it, Equifax, TransUnion, um, and, and Experian are the three major credit reporting agencies. There are other credit reporting agencies as well that you can get your credit reports from. Um, but if you go to those three individual websites, you can you can do it there, and a really good website, one stop shop, annualcreditreport.com, and I see Rochelle smiling. Uh, annualcreditreport.com is is a really good place to go because that's a web that's a legitimate website uh, created to be be that one stop shop to um, then chan a channel it will end up channeling you to the major credit reporting websites so you can obtain that. And another key is never pay for your credit report, right? So annualcreditreport.com is free. You can sign up and then you can go in and navigate and then select whichever credit report you want. So if it's Equifax, if it's uh, TransUnion or Experian, you can pick which one you want. But again, the note is it should be free. Do not sign up for a link and then they ask you for a Visa or a MasterCard. Come out of that browser, make sure it's annualcreditreport.com. And again, it should always be free. And I think Sean mentioned this earlier, 
you have the right as a Georgia citizen to get two credit reports per year, right? And that's a soft pull. It does not negatively impact your credit. So, you know, if you're trying to buy a house, you want to see what your credit looks like, you can get a soft pull and you can get that bureau and do whatever it is you need to do. Or you can, again, Sean talked about this earlier, you can lock your credit and unlock it when you need to. That's my strategy. I recommend that you lock it if you're not going to make a major purchase like a car or a house. Your creditors who are already in business with you can always pull it because you already have a relationship. But those outside of that would have to ask you to unlock it. It takes five minutes to use your pen, unlock it, and then you can select the date that you wanna automatically relock it. So that is a very good strategy to prevent identity theft and to protect your credit and your good name. Thank okay. you, Sean, great information. I was just gonna say the same, great information. Thank you to both of you. I'm gonna turn it over back to Brenda, to, for, Brenda for our next um, presenter. Thank you so much. Appreciate all okay. the questions and engagement. Yes. Thank you, Sean and Freshea. They're very interesting, great information. We do it, uh, let's see, we do a quick poll. What practices should you avoid selecting someone to repair your roof? Getting three bids and writing from local established contractors, uh, using contractors who come to door and tell you they are working for a neighbor asking if the contractor has the required licenses and getting his or her license numbers or paying in advance. You should have a poll on your screen. Thank you. I see the persistence are coming in. All right, you still have time to participate. Okay. All right, we're ending. ending the poll, thank you. Okay, okay. and the results being shared Okay, and the, okay, and the answer to it is B and D. You should avoid using contractors who come to your door and tell you they are working for a neighbor or indefinitely paying in advance. You do want to get three bids and write them from local established contractors. And also you do want to ask the contractors for their uh, license and do your research uh, on that. Okay. And I want to introduce our next speaker. Let me get the information there. And our next speaker will come from Taxpayer Advocate Service, uh, Mr. Philip Oyofo. He started at the IRS in 1987 as a custom service representative. He worked there for five years as a tax examiner and then later in the examination from 1993 to 1995. Afterwards, he worked as in the chief counsel's office in Atlanta as a paralegal specialist from 1996 to 2001. Afterwards, he worked in appeals as an appeals officer from 2002 to 2009, and he became the appeals teams manager for the Portland and Hawaii office from 2010 to 2015. He joined the Tax Fair Advocate Service task in January of 2016 to present as the local Tax Fair Advocate at the Atlanta City Center office. Phil has a BA degree in social sciences, he has a master's in economics and a JD in law. And I would like to present to you my former boss from Taxpayer Advocate Service, the local Taxpayer Advocate, and he is the husband of our star, Elena Oyofo, Mr. Phil Oyofo. Okay, Brenda. I, I, thank you so much for the brilliant introduction. And um, I'm very, very honored to be 
part of this presenter. And um, okay, good. I, I, I want to say, I've listened to the previous two pre presenters, Mr. Con Conroy and Mrs. Fraser. I tell you what, those are excellent, brilliant information, you know, and um, I learned a lot too from you guys' presentation. And uh, you pretty much uh, talked about the identity theft, what it is. And what I hope to do is pretty much focus on how the ID relates to taxes and also, you know, talk briefly on how it relates to medical, okay? And I did send Brenda my slide up front and pretty much the information on the slide, some of those information I may have to skip due to, due to interest of time. And some, some of those information may not be relevant to the audience, okay? Because pretty much um, my understanding is we have uh, pretty much elderly retired folks as part of the audience. Now, uh, just like Brenda said, I've been with the IRS for a long time. And, you know, it's a great place to work. And I've worked with Brenda too. And Brenda is, was a, she's an excellent, excellent co-worker. So uh, I appreciate Brenda and I miss Brenda too. So just like you say, I'm with Taxpayer Advocate Service. Taxpayer Advocate Service is part of the IRS, okay? just like appeals, just like the wage and investment, just like small business SBSC divisions. So we are part of the IRS. However, taxpayer advocate is like an independent body. So the IRS doesn't have much influence over us. You know, my boss, her name is uh, Mrs. Erin Collins. She's the national taxpayer advocate and the assistant is uh, Bridget, Roberts, she's the deputy national taxpayer advocate. Now, I'm the local taxpayer advocate. Um, it's a position that was created by Congress and every state is mandated by law to have a local taxpayer advocate, which is a representation of the national taxpayer advocate. And what we do in taxpayer advocate is we pretty much uh, work with taxpayers that have issues resolving their tax problems with the IRS. You know, for example, you filed your tax return and you waited and you didn't get your tax return. The IRS is not telling you much. Who do you call? You call Taxpayer Advocate Service. And we advocate on your behalf to make sure you get the money you deserve, okay? And, um, not everyone can just pick up the phone and call us. We do have criteria you have to meet to be able to come to our office. We do require that you exhaust all your efforts with the IRS. And, you know, if you still don't have the relief you're looking for, then you qualify to come to our office or my office. Okay. So, again, we're there to advocate on behalf of the taxpayer. And also we, we make sure if we have systemic issues that are preventing taxpayers from getting the relief they're looking for, we do also you know, uh, suggest ways to fix those systemic issues. And my boss usually reports to Congress every year and what she does is she provides to Congress what the top 10 issues taxpayers face when they go before the IRS. In addition to that, she also provides legislative solutions on how to resolve those issues, okay? Uh, for this year, she did the presentation in February and the top issue is funding, you know, like most of you know, IRS needs help, they need money, resources are dry, employees are retiring and we are short of uh, resources, okay? So that was the uh, big number one issue that um, she shared with Congress. And we, as the local taxpayer advocates, we do share those same issues with the congressional offices in the state. See, I cover, uh, 
eight, eight, 16 of the congressional offices in Georgia. So Brenda, if you don't mind, you could go all the way to identity theft on this slide. So like I said, most of my information I will present will focus on how the ID issue relates to taxes and also medical because uh, our audience do need that information. And I will also uh, present how, in case you have ID theft as it relates to taxes, you know, how you can get some help from my office or from the IRS, okay? <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not going to bore you guys with the definition of um, identity theft, but uh, the key thing is when somebody, you know, uses your personal identifiable information, such as your name, social security number, and other personal information to file, to file a tax return and get a refund. Okay, now, I know if you retired, most retired folks may not have a filing requirement, okay? However, most retiring folks do receive a pensions, annuities, social security, investment incomes. So those, those, those information can require you to file, okay? Can require you to file. So for those of you who don't file, someone can steal, steal your identity and file a return on your behalf and get a refund. The other way they could use your identity information, your personal information to, you know, uh, get you your tax, uh, get you to, uh, to, what I'm trying to say is they could use your, your identity, social security number, and they could use that to get a job. They could use that to get a job and you may not get the W-2 at the end of the uh, physical year, the uh, calendar year, However, you're going to get a notice from the IRS that um, you earned income, but you haven't filed a tax return. So what I'm trying to say is with um, identity theft as it applies to taxes, one, they could use your social and file a tax return on your behalf, get a refund, okay? And the other way they could do it is use your identity, social security number to get a job. Okay, we see that all the time. When I was in appeals, we have, you know, friends and relatives sharing social security numbers to get employment. And, you know, the, 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 the rightful owner of the social security number sometimes knows about it. And at the end of the filing, uh, end of the year, they get a W-2 and they claim they never worked at that company. Is similarly the same when somebody steals your identity. You know, they, they work all year, but they don't get the W-2. You get the W-2 because you own the social security. So how do you know that uh, something like that has happened to you? The first thing you will know, uh, the first thing you're going to get to alert you that somebody may be using your social security number is, you know, you, if you try to file, you know, IRS don't tell you, you've already filed, there's more than one tax return in this, in the IRS system, you know. Most of these folks who steal your identity, they're going to file electronically because it's quicker to get a refund when they filed electronically. So when you turn around and you try to file, if you require to file, they're going to tell you more than one return or somebody has already filed. Now, you may get a notice that you owe taxes, okay? Or they're going to get tell you your refund has been offset to back taxes. You know, just imagine you, you're not required to file, then you sit there and all of a sudden you get a notice from the IRS saying um, you owe a balance for the previous year. So that's a, 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 that's a light that goes up to say, look, somebody may be 
filing a return on your behalf, okay? Or you could get a notice that you receive wages from an employer who you never worked for. Like I say, we see this most of the time, but um, with situations like this, sometimes the person with the social security, uh, the real social security number knows, you know, about the other person using the information. Next slide, Brenda. Okay, also, sometimes how do you know if, if you've been a victim and your tax record has been affected? You know, if someone is using your social security number to work or file a fraudulent return in your name, you know, that affects your social security benefits. And you may get a letter or a notice from SSA saying that your benefits has been reduced or stopped because there is a return in the system that shows you made some money. Next slide. So again, most of the retired folks, you know, they may not have that filing requirement, you know, but and um, if you know you're not required to file a federal return and if somebody has used their identity to, 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 to file a return, you will need to, you know, talk to the IRS. You know, the, the most mistake most people make is when they get a notice from the IRS, you know, sometimes they just do not open up the notice. You know, they think the notice is just going to disappear or go away. Uh, the key thing is no matter what it is, you have to open that notice and comply with what it says, you know. And um, just like Mr. Conroy and Mrs. Fraser said, there's a lot of, a lot of phishing going on, you know, a lot of uh, internet scams. And just like uh, Mrs. Fraser said, IRS employees or IRS agents or revenue officers, you know, most of the time, they will send you a notice. They will send you a letter, okay? And on that letter, they tells you, it tells you what you need to do. You know, so when you get those phone calls and type of phishing information asking for your, uh, uh, to pay off the tax amount you owe, the first thing you gotta do, you know, if you don't think it's a legitimate call, if they say they work for the IRS, ask them for their employee ID number. You know, and most of them, they, you know, they don't have that. They don't know what it is. All our IRS employees are required to, you know, give out their employee identification number when asked for it. Okay. So anyway, um, next slide, Brenda. So again, you respond immediately to any notice or letter you receive from the IRS, and the first thing the IRS will tell you to do too is to file the form one four zero three nine, which is identity theft affidavit. Uh, Okay, for individual, uh, you, for, for the business, you file the one with the B. You attach a copy of any identifying information you have, just like your driver's license, social security card. And you, we do have a unit that works solely on identity theft issue. And um, that unit is the Identity Protection Specialist Unit. And the phone number to that unit is, um, listed on the screen. Next uh, slide, Brenda. And um, in addition to filing that uh, form, you need to provide documentation to support the evidence of the ID theft, authentication of identity, and evidence of the business operation. Just like Mr. Conroy did allude to, uh, most victims of ID theft, they do require an ID is, is a special number that the IRS assigns to them that they use to file returns, you know, going forward, you know, to protect their identity. So it's, it's something that is available with the IRS and you can get more information on that if you go to the irs.gov website. So the, I will, down on the slide, uh, further down on the slide, I will address, you know, other issues about um, the, the tax ID theft as you, you know, how to contact my office. The other thing I wanted to touch briefly on is this uh, medical identity theft, what it is. And again, 
it, it relates to somebody stealing your personal information and uses that information, you know, for services, medical services, then they bill Medicare. They build Medicare for medical treatment. They use it for prescription drugs, surgery, and other services. Next slide. And, um, you know, it is really risky. It is costly to correct because you sit in there and all of a sudden, you know, you apply for Medicare services and you you, you get you, you deny coverage for a service or equipment. It can affect your medical insurance records, you know, change your blood type or record, a diagnosis for a disease you don't have. You know, it could be, you could receive, you know, wrong, perhaps harmful treatment because again, this person using your PII information for medical services, you know, may be completely different, you know, from you. You know, next slide. And these are some of the signs that somebody might have uh, compromised your ID and use it, using it for medical services. You know, you get a bill for services you did not receive. You know, you get um, a phone call from a collection agency for money you do not owe. You know, notification from insurance company that you have reached your limit for medical benefits. Uh, you maybe get denial of insurance for a medical condition you don't have. Again, you got to be very, very vigilant when you start getting these notices and um, um, you got to pay attention to those notices and what you need to do. Next slide, Brenda. And just like Mrs. Fraser and Conroy has uh, uh, presented, they, they did allude to a lot of safeguards you can, you know, do for yourself to protect your identity. Here, you protect your Medicare and insurance record cards. You know, you, you can leave them sitting out there on the table. You know, you review your medical summary notices, explanations of benefit statements, and Medicare medical bills. You know, I know for me, I used to get my credit card bill sometimes. What I could do is just go straight to the balance and look at the balance. And if it sounds like what it was last time, I said, oh, okay, this is good information. But honestly, you have to go line by line when you look have these uh, bills and notification. You know, I give a quick example. One time I got a, uh, I have a Bank of America credit card and um, I just look at the balance and put it away. Then two months down the road, I got another bill. When I looked at the balance, it was, the balance was $2,000. I'm like, well, wait a minute, I know I didn't charge within uh, two weeks, uh, $2,000 worth of information, but what happened was, you know those uh, checks you get in the mail from the financial institution, sometimes they say you could fill this out and use that to pay bills. You know, somebody got hold of one of those uh, checks that came to my mailbox and they used it to make a, a deposit only to an account and I got the bill. Luckily, I read that statement, and within 60 days of that event taking place, I called the bank, and the bank was able to, you know, void that charge. So uh, you need to pretty much pay attention to those statements and bill you get, you know. You got to be aware of offers for free equipment, services, or goods in exchange for Medicare numbers. You know, you got to shred papers with your medical identity and destroy prescription labels before throwing in the trash. Very good information. You don't know who is watching you, you know. I make sure when I get my, my um, credit card bills now, you know, I make sure I shred them or rip them to little pieces and soak them in oil before I dispose of them. How do you respond to medical identity theft? First, you got to obtain your medical file. You got to write to your health plan or provider for correction if, there's, if you find something wrong. You got to report your concerns to the Senior Medicare Parole, SMP. And he, they, the website to find who your SMP contact is is listed below. Next slide, Brenda. 
most cases, now we're going back to tax ID theft, you know, when you a victim of a tax ID theft, most cases can, can and should be resolved through normal IRS channels, okay? You call the taxpayer assistance centers, you call the toll-free telephone services, practitioner, priority services, if you are a practitioner, and go next slide, Brenda. Yeah, all right. And uh, uh, those are the normal channels you, you, you try to use before, before you can make an attempt to come to taxpayer, uh, taxpayer advocate service in case you don't get the relief you're looking for when you're talking to the IRS, then you can come to taxpayer advocate service if you meet some of these criteria. These are some of the criteria we require you to meet and uh, I'm not going to bore you with those criteria, but the key thing is if IRS tells you we're going to, you know, give you a response in 30 days or we could resolve your issue in 30 days and you don't get that resolve in 30 days, you do qualify to come to Taxpayer Advocate Service. Next uh, slide, Brenda. Uh, you going back, going forward. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, again, these are some of the remedies that has been shared with uh, Mr. Conroy and Mrs. Fraser. You check your credit report once a year, report, request a copy of your credit report, review your bank statements. Next slide. And if you have been a victim of identity theft, we do require you to report that information to the Federal Trade Commission. You also file an affidavit with the Federal Trade Commission if you have been a victim. Next slide. You secure your personal information at your house, shred unneeded documents with personal information, and don't give out personal information on the phone, through the email or internet unless you initiate the contact. Next slide, Brenda. Again, you got to protect your SS number. You, you protect your computer, use firewalls, anti-spam, virus softwares, and update security patches. Uh, well, I'm not going to bore you with this slide also. These are some of the uh, rights we do let taxpayers know they have when they go before the IRS to try to get their issues resolved. You know, we call it taxpayers' bill of right. There are ten of them. You have, the, they have the right. Taxpayers have the right to be informed. Quality service, pay no more than the correct amount of tax. Challenge the IRS position and be heard. Appeal an IRS decision in an independent forum. Next slide. Um, they the right to finality, privacy, confidentiality, retain representation and the right to a fair and just tax system. These are the 10 rights that my boss, the National Taxpayer Advocate Service, made sure taxpayers have when they go before the IRS. You guys have, have heard stories about, um, maybe that was 15, 20 years ago when you know um, IRS was pulled before Congress and people were testifying the type of treatment they were receiving. And it was horrible, horrible treatment. And, um, uh, based on those complaints, um, the National Taxpayer Advocate fought for these rights, you know, and um, now we from Taxpayer Advocate Service are sure that uh, these rights are protected when taxpayers, you know, go before the IRS. Next slide, Brenda. Now, this is the Taxpayer Advocate website, and if you Google the website, you can always get um, assistance on how to uh, use our services and also you, you will see more information about the taxpayers bill of rights next slide Brenda. well uh, this is our collection alternatives that uh, i would say pretty much not relevant to this uh, this um, presentation however if you do have you know tax issues and you don't can't pay what you owe your choices are you could request an installment agreement, you could do offer and compromise, or if you don't have the ability to pay, you could ask the IRS to put you in non-collectible status CNC, 
And uh, if there are liens and levies, we can walk you through on how to get those uh, removed. Next slide. And this is the link to contact the Taxpayer Advocate Service. And um, the, if you dial 1877 7747-78, that puts you to one of the local taxpayer offices. Uh, I'm over at the one at the summit building. I used to be over at the one at the campus, but now I moved over to the one at the summit building, 401 West Peachtree Street. And since last year, all our folks have been working from home. Next slide, Brennan. So the key thing again, most of the ID information has been presented with uh, presented by Mr. Conroy, Mrs. Fraser. And when it comes to taxes, the key thing is um, when you are a victim of it, if you call the Taxpayer Advocate Service Office or the IRS office, we should be able to walk you through as to how you get relief and um, get help. I guess that's pretty much a summary of what my presentation is. And um, in case you have any questions, um, I can take any of those questions. Mr. Ofo, oh, your fault. Oh, your fault. Thank you for that correction. I did have one question. Great presentation. Um, last year, I'm telling you, as soon as the pandemic hit, from a financial perspective, we started seeing a lot of unemployment fraud, meaning consumers were having someone else file unemployment in their names. Did, has there been a task force of some sort set up or a separate number to kind of deal with this during the pandemic, the uh, unemployment fraud that we're seeing? Well, you know, what I would say to that is perhaps that is a question to the Department of Labor because you know they're the ones that pretty much administer uh, the unemployment compensation benefits. The, the IRS, we have responsibility as to, uh, to, to educate the taxpayers on how to report the unemployment benefits received. And the information I could share on that is Congress recently, last month, they passed a bill that says uh, the $10,200 of unemployment compensation benefit received for this year, which was 2020, is exempt from taxes. Usually, the general rule is unemployment compensation benefits is taxable to the recipient. But because of the situation, Congress recently exempted $10,200 for single individuals. Now for married individuals, that's doubled, okay? And um, that is the most current information we have on unemployment compensation. And in terms of the fraud, I believe that is the Department of Labor jurisdiction to address that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Since unemployment does not follow within your regime, I wanted to ask about the frauds that we're seeing, seeing with the PPE loans. Uh, I've had occasion to have conversations with people who had PPE loans applied for on their behalf for a fee and now they're having to, uh, they're receiving information on the potential of having to repay those loans and they are not sure what to do. Again, that, that is a question. <laughs> <laughs> that is a question perhaps to the same, I would say uh, to whatever department is, uh, you know, issuing those uh, loans because for, for us, the Taxpayer Advocate Service and the IRS, you know, our main objective is to talk about perhaps the taxability of those loans or not, but when it comes to fraudulent, um, fraudulent means of getting those loans, uh, what are the consequences? I, I think that is 
will be better addressed by the department that administers those loans, honestly. I, I mean, in my department, uh, Taxpayer Advocate Service, um, again, we, that is not something we, we address at this time, okay. honestly. Mm -hmm. so, so if you have someone out there peddling PPE loans as if they were a commodity, uh, and they people are becoming victims of that practice. Is that not under your purview? No, it's not because it, it, it has to have a tax return angle to it. You with me? For example, maybe somebody, um, well, it's a loan. So usually loans are not taxable to the recipient because you have an obligation to pay it back. Well, it, well, this is the federal government's loan. So that, that is that's correct. a little bit different. Well, again, uh, whatever agency that is administering that. Okay. Because, but in general, when you get a loan, you know, you, you are expected to pay that loan back. Now, there are situations where, you know, I'm sure you know of this, when the recipient doesn't pay back the loan and the institution, what they call it, they, they, they forgive the loan. At that time, what do they do? Yeah, they issue the 1099-T mm -hmm. as a forgiven debt. Mm -hmm. Then at that moment, the question now becomes, is that amount taxable to the taxpayer? That's where we step in and say, okay, okay let's look at the taxpayer's financial ability at that time. Were they insolvent or not? You follow me? Yes. yes All yes. right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You welcome. Uh, we have a raised hand, uh, Edith. If you'd like to ask your question. Yes, I would. Um, in all of this fraud and scams and all that we're talking about, where do do companies such as LifeLock that if you were to engage and get uh, get a LifeLock a uh, security plan or something, and what information uh, would you get? Are you supposed to give to that company? I know they say your social security uh, number. Uh, is it safe to go on? And, you have wh what information should you give to LifeLock to look in to your just to keep a roll on your uh, thing? I'm confused on that because I don't want to be giving them too much information. They said whatever information you want to give them, that's what they will look into. So could you address LifeLock or companies like that, please? I'm pretty much sure the question is open to the three, uh, the two or three presenters and um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll take that one. And then Sean, if you want to piggyback on me. So LifeLock is a legitimate company. That's number one. It is a legitimate company. And what they do is they have a credit monitoring service as well as an advocacy service. If you are a victim of identity theft, they will assist you in doing all of the legwork, right? To untangle the web. So it is a legitimate company. And if you select to uh, hire them to assist you, then that's okay to do so. That is okay to do so. But again, know that they can only do as much as you help them with what it is you have been a victim of. You want to file a police report. You can also add a notice to your credit report that you are a victim of identity theft so that to not open any credit in your name without contacting you and you leave a contact number in your consumer area of your credit report. But again, to answer your question, LifeLock is a legitimate company and their services are advocacy and doing the work for you so that you're not on the phone calling 15 creditors to say, hey, I didn't apply for a loan and this isn't my loan and this isn't my debt. They have a call center and they assist you with doing just what it is we're talking about if you become a victim. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Sean, you wanted to add something? Yeah, yeah sure. that sort of order um, answers my, do you, am I still on? Uh, that sort of answers my question, but I have, uh, I, I do not have identity theft or anything like that. Is this a precaution 
measure I should be taking. And I have to give them my information so that if those numbers or whatever I want to give them show up, then they can tell me. Uh, I guess they are my eyes when I'm not looking. Do I need them right now or only when you have identity theft? Or will they tell you you have? That's what it is. They are supposed to be telling me I have identity theft, but what type of information do I need to give them for them to uh, keep a watch on that for me? Sean, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think, uh, Ms. Blunt, I think the most, my comment would be if, if the most important thing, if you have not done it, is to freeze your credit to protect yourself. And second, um, we, I know that uh, I have been involved in uh, breaches where I have received notification and been offered and I accepted free credit monitoring services. And if you, if any, you know, if you do receive these uh, notices that you've been involved with a breach and they offer free credit monitoring, take that uh, potentially versus paying for something that, that might be, uh, uh, that you might otherwise pay for. Um, so I make the analogy, you know, you can pay, you can do some of this on your own. You know, they may offer services like Rochelle says that will help you clean up after the fact. Um, but that's a choice. That, and as far as providing them information, if you're going to do business with them, they, they're going to, they may require certain pieces of information and, You've got to decide if you want to provide that or not. I don't know if you would have a choice as to whether or not to provide them certain pieces of information. Um, so I hope that helps with the what answer your question. And and I would also add, if you're not comfortable with LifeLock, all three credit reporting agencies also offer the same service, right? So you can go to Experian, you can go to Equifax, and you can go to TransUnion and pay for an additional package to do just what LifeLock is offering you. So if you're not comfortable with LifeLock, all three major reporting credit bureaus also offer the same service for a fee. Okay, so just be aware, you have options to be put, position yourself to be preventive versus waiting until an incident happens. Right, that's what I'm doing. Okay, thank you. And sometimes uh, you're in, you could check with your insurance company as well. They will sometimes offer that type of product. Um, and, and real quick, I put a link to a press release uh, regarding unemployment fraud in the chat. Um, in the press release, and this is, this is important, oh, I've spoken to a number of people who are questioning whether they, you know, they, their mother may have received a 1099 in the mail, or they may have received a a letter from the Georgia Department of uh, uh, the Georgia, the Unemployment Department, um, with a their their address, but someone else's name. We need to report these these issues to the Georgia Department of Labor, because there is uh, uh, has been a a great increase in unemployment fraud, and it's it they are working through investigating these. It's gonna take some time, but it's, it's important to report these. So if you hear of someone in your, in your universe that, that is questioning whether they need to say anything about the letter they received, tell them to report it, um, please. I, I just want to uh, share uh, one piece of information in follow up to the question Pamela asked about the uh, loans, the paycheck protection program loans, and um, the, the one piece of information I can share with or add to that is the fact that if those federal loans are forgiven to the individual, that portion of that money, the amount forgiven is not taxable income to the individual, okay? So double fraud, double benefit. But anyway, okay. Thank you. The right, well, I'm saying the rightful individual. If you got it right wrong and it was forgiven by the government, and you know, you shouldn't be paying taxes on it, right? Okay. But with the fraud aspect of it, that's a whole <laughs> different ballgame. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're gonna get uh going towards the uh end of things here. Uh, back up in here. All right, we'll skip that. <laughs> okay, so you've learned about types of financial exploitation, tips for recognizing scams, uh, strategies for avoiding identity theft, and uh, including medical identity theft. Uh, there should be a resource um, package. A uh, link in the um, I'm sorry, timer going off. And um, it is resources to help us avoid financial exploitation. The resource uh, sheet should uh, have this type of information in here. You have information from FDIC. You have the uh, link to the website, and this is the link to the FDIC money savvy. The Money Smart for Older Adults Resource Guide. This guide has valuable information, and this is basically what most of the presentation has been about uh, today, and it has additional resources in the back of it. It's an outstanding guide. Also, the Office of the Attorney General, this is the website uh, to their office, and the guide that they have, the Georgia Consumer Protection Guide for Older Adults, which is what... Um, Sean has showed you earlier the cover of it, and it has excellent information, wealth of information in it as well. The Taxpayer Advocate Service is the website link uh, to it, the toll-free number, and the publication one, your rights as a taxpayer. It provides the 10 Bill of Rights uh, for taxpayers on there, and also it explains each one. It has additional information on the second page regarding uh, examination, collection, in appeals in this publication. The publication 1546 is the Taxpayer Advocate Service uh, is here to help you. That is the uh, publication that includes the listing of all Taxpayer Advocate Offices. You have a Taxpayer Advocate Office in every state. And so you can look at the publication to identify the Taxpayer Advocate Service Office in your state to um, contact if you need to contact them. Also, there's the, this is a, a list in the link to the IRS Dirty Dozen Tax Scams list. And because it's like each year, uh, the scams, they some of them are repeating and then they're getting uh, more and more uh, updated with the scams that they come up with. Also, this particular sheet has some additional uh, information on it, as well as information regarding the three uh, credit bureaus on that. This is the cover of the Money Smart for Older Adults Resource Guide. And this is what it looks like. And like I say, it has a wealth of information up in there. And this is the cover for the Georgia Consumer Protection Guide for Older Adults. And he has a wealth of information in it as well. So I know there are uh, some family and friends from Alabama and other states uh, that's on the line, Road Tide, and thank you all for attending. And But you can contact uh, research for your state's consumer protection office as well. And because there are some things that may be in this guide that's uh, for Georgia, and but you can contact your state's protection, uh, Georgia Consumer Protection, to get information for your state. But there's a lot of general information that's uh, you know available and that will uh, help you nationwide. And this is just showing the cover of TAS Publication 1546. Again, it provides a listing of um, taxpayer advocates' offices in each state. So if you need assistance from the Taxpayer Advocate Service, please review that pamphlet to uh, identify who you need to contact for your state. And so for our uh, speaker certificates, let me stop sharing right quick. I want to get something else up. Just a second. Uh, and while Brenda is working on that, uh, for our participants. Uh, we will be sharing that uh, those guide that resource with you via email. That request has gone out. So we'll send that out uh, because it's kind of hard to get that link to download at this point. So we will send that out to the people who registered. Okay. 
and don't leave. You still have more to go. We have prizes. So you've hung in there this long. Hang in here with us. We have beautiful prizes we can't wait to give away. And everyone is eligible to win. Everyone. I'm not sure. Is this showing the certificate? It's showing half of it. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. All right. We want the first certificate presentation to Priscilla Frazier. We appreciate you for your presentation that you made today. And we have one for Sean Conroy. Thank you. And excuse me, the saying certificate of appreciation, Economic Development Committee of Stone Mountain Lithonia Illuminate Chapter, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, proudly presents to Sean Conroy, Office of Attorney General. Thank you for your participation in Monday Smart and Savvy Workshop awarded this 21st April 2021, signed by our president, uh, Donette and our uh, chairperson uh, with this. And then also here's the one presentation to uh, Phil Boyofo of Tax Advocate Service. And so I will get these sent out to you all. Thank you all so much for your presenting, uh, uh, making your presentations to us and the information that you provide. It was very beneficial and great. And y'all did an outstanding job uh, with that. And so uh, we'll go back to um to Pam here come the prizes right okay yes. all cool. right so <laughs> okay and also with the survey will be in the um to be in the chat and if you could please uh survey uh with that and while we getting set up for the prizes our um president Danette Battle uh would you like to say something Uh, good morning. I'm looking at the clock. I can't believe it's still morning time. Usually we have these in the afternoon or evening sometime. Uh, this was a phenomenal presentation. Um, we say we target, we target this, I realize that for our older citizens, but for me, this would definitely apply to my life today and also to my daughters. I could pass on to them because you should start planning early. I think the earlier, the better, especially when you talk about your financial stability. Uh, to all of our guests and our guest hosts, thank you so much for sharing that information with us because, again, this helps us as we, our initiatives, as we continue to inform and bring awareness to our community. So it truly helps us to make sure that they become um, astute uh, uh, um, citizens of Georgia. Uh, to our committee, I thank you all so very much uh, because it takes a lot of planning. I realize that. And this is, a, uh, again, very valuable information. But to all, take this with you and pass it on to the next person. And we don't need to hold this for ourselves. So continue to pass along the information and share what we've learned today. Again, thank you all so very much. I'm not standing in the way of the prizes because I'm, I'm very excited about that myself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. All right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, sir, Battle. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully it works. You can do it. <laughs> I know. All right, here we go. Is Stephen here? I saw him on earlier. Okay, you have to be present to win. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay. And so, if if your name comes up, if you could then just flash your pictures so you could we can verify that you are still here. So Stephen is not here. Oh well, we'll keep going. <laughs> oh. Oh, man.
Elena. Elena's still here. All right. All right. Hello, I'm here. I got you. Thank you. <laughs> Andrea. Andrea, you still with us? I'm still here. Congratulations. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. How many more do we have, Pam? I think we have two more. All right. I think people are feeling lucky. Let's see. Oh, that's on the line. Okay, Stephanie. Oh, Stephanie's not here. Let's keep going. Stephanie's not here? She was here. She left too soon. Okay. I'm using the participants list as you do it. Okay, awesome. Monet Mitchell. I'm not here anymore. Ah. Let's go. I know we're a minute over. Okay. Jennifer. Jennifer is here. Congratulations, Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that it or do we have one more? One more. All right. This is it. Pamela, Pamela, Pamela. Oh. <laughs> Imani. Imani's here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. But each of you want a $25 Visa gift card. <laughs> we'll get that sent to you. <laughs> and on behalf of the Economic Development Committee, thank you all again for joining us for this very enlightening session. Brenda, thank you for all your hard work. Committee members, thank you for showing up. And as usual, showing out to our guests, thank you on behalf of the citizens of Georgia and DeKalb County in particular. You all have a great day. Sora Stallworth, uh, someone asked in the chat, uh, where do you email the survey? Economic development at smlac.org. Thank you, Sora. Please consider having this um, presentation again. <laughs> I'm begging you, this was excellent. And thank you for asking uh, Shiki and I to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate all your support. And thank you everyone for attending. And thank you presenters. And, uh, thank you. Thank you technology as always. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, Brenda Stallworth, great job in the planning and the execution. Great Hello. job. Hats off to you, lady. Hats thank off. You. Thank you. And to uh, the leadership of the committee. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> this was excellent. Please do this again. We definitely need this. Not just for our years, but our, our and this has been recorded, so it will be available in the SMLAC library. Yeah. Oh, that would be great, ladies. I don't see a survey in the chat. Was it in the chat? It, yes, it it's in the chat along with. It's called evaluation okay. form. I can put it back in there if y'all want me to put it back in there again. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Okay, give me one second. This is probably maybe at the top. Here's the evaluation form. And the resources. Do you all see both documents? Yes, ma'am. Thank okay. you. All right. I'll give I'll give um, people time to download that before we hang up.
Thank you so much, Mr. Colin Roy. I see his email. Mm -hmm. We may want to stop recording now. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies. I'll see you.